just thinking about how cool it is. If you're thinking about what you can can accomplish, that might be a different answer. Okay, so I'm gonna agree with you. Yeah. Um, probably assassinate Stalin. Yeah. Um, let Trotsky lead the Soviet Union. Let's see how that goes. Um, yeah. And I'm probably gonna go back and become friends with Lord Byron. Just with, I have to. I I get to bring back modern uh, condoms with me. But <laughs> you want to fuck Lord Byron? Who doesn't? So but you want to be a friend with benefits with Lord Byron? That all of Lord Byron's friends were friends with benefits. But um, that, and I'll probably get some sort of poem written about me, which will baffle scholars for generations. So yeah, maybe Lord Byron seems really exhausting <laughs> to hang out with. I, I didn't say I have to be have. long-term friends with him. I just have to be friends with him. Yeah, maybe that could work. That's acceptable. As long as you're assassinating Stalin. Yeah. That's really the big thing. I'd assassinate Stalin. Uh, maybe I'd convince, I'd become friends with Ronald Reagan and try to convince him not to go into politics. <laughs> I don't think it's worth it. Yeah, that'd be exhausting too. There's no historical figure that I'm like, should I become friends with you? And then it's like, this is a lot of work. I don't think I want to do that. So I don't know. What if like you just like go back in time and find like a 14th century peasant and they're just like the night nicest fucking guy, like that person. You don't know. Just in like in real life, you don't you don't know who your best friend's gonna be. Yeah, you never know. It could be uh, a little boy named Kevin. Oh, you know what? No, I changed my answer. What? Uh, the public universal friend. Or Puff. Um, <laughs> what? I told you about this before. It's like one of the earliest uh, well-documented non-binary people where it was like a Quaker community in the United States where this woman or, yeah, this person had a supposed vision from God. Okay. And yeah, stopped referring to themselves with gendered pronouns and basically dressed completely uh, agendered. And the Quaker community, that's sort of just their thing. Is It's like, oh, we... Believe. It was a revelation. It was a revelation. Yeah. So they accepted them for the longest time. And it was just like, oh, that's that's cool. So you'd be friends with the public universal friend? Yes. You know what? That's a pretty good answer. Yeah. Also, that's definitely the way we have to start the show. <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Austin. And I'm your public universal friend, Max. Yeah, that's actually, you know what? I think from now on, Whenever we st do our warm up conversation and we just happen upon some sort of weird, interesting tidbit, we just have to. It doesn't matter if we've been yeah. talking for two seconds, we just have to start the show because you know what? People deserve to know about this. The yeah. public universal friend. And if I add that in the show notes with no explanation whatsoever, they'll be like, What is this? <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad you told me about that. That's neat. I think I'm, maybe I thought I'd talked to you about it before. Otherwise, I would have brought it up <laughs> the public universal friend. Oh, man. I just hope that doesn't get appropriated by these uh, capitalists in America we live under and uh, turn it into some sort of robot that is secretly surveilling you. I mean, that's that's just Alexa already. Hello, mm -hmm. I am the public universal friend unit. <laughs> Poofu. But uh, anyway. I wish sometimes I wish we could just time travel back to <laughs> times before we lived in a weird Neo corporate fucking surveillance yes, government before Ronald Reagan and the bad times. Yes. No, yes. Uh, today's movie is Time Bandits. You might have been able to surmise from the title, yeah. obviously, but also our, our thematically relevant conversation. Oh, look at us. We're so great <laughs> at this. But yes, this is my pick this week, and uh, I have no clue why I chose this. Neither do I. <laughs> um, I think I was just thinking of like, what is a tonal shift? From the Human Centipede. We did have to watch the Human Centipede last week. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed that. No, yeah. I think we did an okay job. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, it's never a bad thing to do movies that aren't to our liking, necessarily. Yeah. It's okay to talk about movies we don't like. In fact, sometimes it's vital to do it. So no problem doing that. But it is like a real palate cleanser to come back to this movie. And I don't think I had seen it in about six years. Or so this is again one of the earlier movies in the criterion collection that i wound up watching um it's a terry gilliam movie and uh i really enjoyed it at the time even though i did not remember a lot about it aside from certain set pieces going into it this week i feel like watching it again for the show i came across a bunch of neat ideas that I think are going to be really fun to talk about during the commentary track. Uh, I think this is a very 
Lacanian movie, but also it's kind of like a Lacanian Marxist type movie. And uh, without really intending to do so, I chose a movie that I think falls very neatly into this, the description of like Reaganite cinema, which will un- unpack that idea more in the commentary track. But I feel like within that, it's also very bizarre because it's very much a movie that seems part of this, like we'll call it the Amblin film cycle, these kids movies from the eighties that started cropping up. And I think you can kind of put star Wars in there, some earlier Spielberg movies as well. But really the big one is, I mean, the big one is where Amblin gets their logo from it's ET, but also you got stuff like gremlins, uh, the Goonies, of Goonies, course. Yes. Um, you have this movie, sort of, even though it belongs outside the if cycle. If it inspired for Stranger reasons. Things, then yes, it's that genre. That's a good, another really good way to think of it. Stuff like Hook. Yeah. Um, maybe also uh, The Gate. The Gate belongs outside the cycle, but it's a similar, it's the a Gates, suburban kids fantasy. The Gate's more, more horror, but yeah. Yeah, suburban kids fantasy. Uh, poltergeist, slightly. Yeah, right? You get the idea. The point is this. You mo- know what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty clear. So like this movie participates in that cycle, but at the same time, uh, especially in the last 30 seconds, it sort of reveals itself to be not very committed to buying into the sentimentality that you often get with a lot of those movies. And if you look at this in a Lacanian oh, perspective, I don't think it buys into it at all. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm just saying like it may not be clear to you as you're watching it until the last 30 seconds that it doesn't buy into it, but you will definitely realize by the end that it is not interested in delivering you back to uh, the status quo at the beginning of the movie without there being any real changes and everything's hunky dory and we're holding hands now. It's not interested in that. Um, And if you look at that from a Lacanian perspective, that hunky dory sort of like sentimentality that would be like an ideological embracing of ideology, right? And if we look at this as Reaganite cinema, that'd be embracing that type of neoliberal ideology. So I feel like this movie, even though it's a movie that I understand people have issues with the pacing of it, which makes sense to me, it's kind of bizarre in its structure. And you might say it's basically a bunch of sketches that are strung together, right? Uh, I think it still sort of works and it kind of works even if this wasn't their intention as a weird type of semi satire of that type of Amblin movie. And that's my take on it. But I just think it's fun to watch. It's got great design and everything. Well, it's interesting because this movie came out before most of the movies were lumping it in with. So yeah. like it's not an intentional parody at all. No. Um, despite carrying many of the cast and creators of Monty Python in it um yeah although let me just add to what you're saying to deepen the mystery terry gilliam at least on the commentary track for the criterion disc clearly seems to be talking about the production of this movie as something that they started in reference to the idea they had of a of a like kids family movie yeah so it's like what were they referencing because it is so similar to everything that would follow it and it, i've i've watched a lot of like BBC specials and like stuff. And they have this show called like horrible histories, which is a lot of like the humor kind of seems kind of similar to this, but Mm -hmm. that, that was later. That was like a nineties, late nineties, early two thousand show. Yeah. But like, I I think that's just sort of a cultural thing that's in the air (laughs) over there. Just, and this movie's interesting in a lot of ways for me. I'd never seen it before this week. I had heard of it um, kind of in the same circles that you had mentioned it, where occasionally I'd hear older nerds referencing movies that was like, oh, E.T. and stuff and the Goonies and, you know, time bandits. People don't talk about that. Never ending story. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd hear references to it and I just sort of like threw it in a category in my brain and was just like, okay, cool. Yeah. I, I, I don't really need to see that. And, well, I'm not, I'm not going to be like, oh my God, this was the best movie ever. I was such an idiot. I'm glad I watched it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it has a lot of good bits. Um, and I'm also, time travel either is amazing or terrible in movies. There's <laughs> yes. no in between. And a good way to do time travel, I think, is to not care. 
And because <laughs> the second you're just like, oh, but what if, what if I leave my shoe here and it changes the course of History. everything? <laughs> yes. You know what? Fuck you. What if Hitler steps on my shoe? And then because of that, he becomes mega Hitler. Um, <laughs> but this movie's just like, no, what if you just like show up at ancient Greece with a Polaroid camera and don't make any attempts to hide it and take pictures and show it to the people in ancient Greece and nobody cares and history isn't changed at all. And just then you go on a different adventure and have a good time and learn nothing from it. It's just, we're using these as set pieces because you shouldn't be asking, you should be having a good time along with the rest of the movie. And if we're doing our job as filmmakers and comedians, then you'll be laughing too hard to be like, wait a minute, isn't it weird? Why, why is this happening? Also, if I'm not above nitpicking movies when they're not entertaining me, but like this is a children's movie about time traveling with dwarves through different time and going to mythical lands and whatnot. Maybe don't just be like, oh, there should be deep historical altercations because of the fact that we're going back. And that's why I love it so much. The performances range from very funny to just like, oh, okay, this is a bit character. They don't need to be perfect. But overall, there's nobody that stands out as terrible in the movie. So Yeah, they got their whole Monty Python crew, you, like the regulars. Yeah. Yeah. The, when you think of Monty Python, you got you got the Palin, you got the Cleese, you got you got the the two core members. Yeah, prominently in here. Uh, you also got Shelley Duvall, who's great in this movie in multiple. And Peter Vaughn, and yeah. and um and one other person who who the fucking or David Warner is the bad guy. Yeah, he was great. He's evil. His name is evil. <laughs> That's just his name. He he probably made me laugh more than anybody else. He has some movie. really good lines for sure. Yeah, um, but actually, I'll challenge you on that. I will say that this movie, you could argue, maybe structures itself in reference to movies that want to be viewed as entertainment. And I have a bunch of quotes that I'm going to dish out over the commentary track from different sources, whether it's Robert Wood or Robin Wood um, or uh, Andrew Britton, about entertainment films, as they call them, at least this type of entertainment film, Reaganite cinema, and uh, how it's like asking the audience to evaluate it. I think this movie does a tricky thing where it's like giving you that thing where it's like, listen, don't worry about it. Let's just have fun. But at the same time, it blows it all up right at the end. And in a way where you're like, what the fuck was that? And it's unignorable. Like Max, you didn't see this movie before, but before like our comment, we even go to the commentary track. I really do want to ask like, what was the response to the ending of this? Cause this is very, this is one of the most abrupt endings of any movie we've done on the show. Um, if not the most abrupt, you remember, <laughs> my response to this ending, which was, no, they're not going to end. Excuse me. <laughs> they're ending the movie on this. Yeah. What? <laughs> Cause it is just sort of a very abrupt, bizarre ending. Yeah. And honestly, I was going into this kind of expecting a labyrinth esque ending mm -hmm. where it's like, Oh, well you're back in the real world with your sort of bleh parents and they're going to slightly be more affectionate to you, but the dwarves are going to come out the side of your wall again and just be like listen if you ever jump need magic jump yeah if you ever need us we're gonna be here and we're gonna be friends forever no fuck you your parents blow up don't like, spoil it if you're listening to the podcast fuck you uh, <laughs> okay so max just spoiled it but still yeah you should watch the movie because it's really it's quite special uh how that happens um but no i feel like that's the really the point that makes it satire and when it like stops being entertainment because it like leaves you oh, with that this. That was very entertaining for me. Oh, it is entertaining in this perverse way though. Cause it's like, what the fuck? <sighs> but yeah. So, um, Terry Gilliam, uh, you know, I'm sort of give or take with him as a director. Uh, I know he's just historically been like very snake bitten as a filmmaker where like there's so many times his movies just get like fucked up basically to the point of like not being recoverable <laughs> yeah. whatsoever. Uh, I know he spent like 30 years or whatever trying to make Don Quixote. And then like he gets hit with natural disasters. Like people get sucked up in tornadoes or, or some <laughs> shit. It's like, God damn it. God um, does not want you to make this film. Yeah. He seems cursed. Um, but he's kind of a filmmaker. I'm like sort of ho-hum on, but he does have a great sense of design and also just his sense of like, Brazil. Like. Yeah, he's got a sense of reverence that even if he can't 
truly articulate some of the political implications of it, I think it lends a few of his movies as being really quite um, vicious. And this this maybe at the end sort of becomes a movie like that. But it's it's just kind of a delightful romp. And uh, I think we're going to have a lot to say about it. So, Max, are you ready to jump in? I, I, I lost my map. Do you have it? Yeah, we should go back in time and watch this movie like the first time we watched it. Oh, that would be wonderful. Let's go. All right. Criterion Collection Edition, by the way. Does it have subtitles? Yeah, it does, Max. Okay. They're on this time. I'm going to have to give that up now. I'm... I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry we took your bit away from you. My, my, my crusade of righteousness. I just think that while everybody was sleeping, they went in and changed everybody's DVD copies to have subtitles. Do you so... think when he was a boy in school, John Cleese would be like, my name is John Cheese? And then be like, that's just a spelling error to fool like teachers? No. Okay. See, I would do that, but that's why I, I'm not I, a comedian. That's. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did that just defeat you? Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm glad we're starting off the episode with this energy. Well, the good thing is that we can only go up from here. Or we could just continue at this level for the entire time. That's true. Oh, God, that's loud. Just like going through time would be. I bet it would be loud. Physicists, leave a comment. Well, physicists, I believe, say that going back in time is like you can't. You can go forward in time. You can't go back in time. Fools. <laughs> <laughs> I'll only listen to you when you validate my preconceived positions. I've watched Doctor Who a lot. And <laughs> I know all I need is a fucking box. And what was that joke you made? You're like, at least we I know at the very least we could go back in time to World War Two and the Blitz. Yeah. <laughs> As long as this is filmed on a BBC set, we'll always be able to go back to London during the Blitz. Yes. So here we are, Max. I think this is the central image of the movie. This image. Not only of... A transparent kitchen. Well, just the... Yeah, the kitchen covered in plastic. The parents, you know, stuck in their their suburban ennui. Yeah. uh, Watching the stupid, dumb television show your money or your life hosted by Jim Broadbent where I guess the premise of the show is like you answer some stupid question or like your husband gets drowned in a vat of soap. They kill them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I might watch that. I don't know. Your money or your life featuring the Kardashians. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, reality TV is kind of dying anyway. So why not at this point? But the reason I think this is the real main image of the movie relates to a lot of things. And I think it relates back to your comment earlier about the idea of this as entertainment film and the idea of looking at this as a type of Amblin film, which a lot of people at the time called it the death death of cinema because they thought it was stupid and like shallow and like, you know, popcorny. They used to call them e-ticket rides, which is a reference to an old like system that I think Disney used to have for like different types of tickets for like theme park rides, right? Where they're like this, this, uh, these movies are theme park rides. There's no content. There's no subtext or content useful to audiences at all. Right. And I think that opinion is sort of reactionary and stupid. That being said, some of the articles and essays I'm going to quote here, I think have very concise criticisms of these types of movies, looking at them as Reaganite cinema, neoliberal cinema, movies that embrace Ooh. ideology. Oh, there's the image of another great image. You said that this shot like pretty much influenced a lot of the development of the movie. Yeah, if I listened to the commentary track on this Criterion edition disc, which is a loaded with great features, by the way. I recommend it. Um and Terry Gilliam says on the track that when they were writing the movie, that was the first image in his mind. His his sort of oh, this shot is great too. This Maurice Sendak type thing. Where's his bedroom is transforming. Uh, the first image in his mind was the idea of that night bursting through the closet. But Max, before we get too far in this movie, what I want to establish is just revisit some of these ideas from Lacan because I know they're very confusing. And frankly, I just recommend if you're listening to this and you're curious to learn more about Lacan, listen to our Racerhead episode, really any of our David Lynch episodes because we use a lot of uh, Lacan in talking about those movies and I think we do a decent job of like fleshing out his ideas in more length there. But essentially, Lacan 
sort of Lacanian analysis of narrative relies on a type of like Hollywood dialectical structure, which we talk about a lot. But the idea is this, you have a character with a desire and when they're working in fantasy genre, it's like they start in a world that is normal and recognizable and it's a world of desire. They had, and by desire, we also mean lack. Kevin here lacks a family unit, right? He wants a family to look up to who isn't bogged down by like, you know, quotidian existence in suburbia. That's what he lacks. So he goes into the world of fantasy, his fantasy, in order to find an answer. Which is old history stuff, because that's what he loves. We, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is him talking about how... Agamemnon. Spart- yeah. yeah. Agamemnon and his men could kill people in 10 seconds with their hands. And- Killed 40 people in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, usually what would happen in a movie like this is uh, sort of along the lines of something like Wizard of Oz. In fact, I'd say Wizard of Oz is probably the supreme example of this type of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, where we go into the world of fantasy and then we return to reality. But when we return to reality, fantasy has equipped us to somehow meet the demands of reality in a way that we now can make peace with it and find it satisfying. There's been a, a thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis structure. Of course, the thing about that is, and something we've talked about with a number of different movies, is when you have that synthesis structure especially when it's a movie where you're encountering like some sort of other more so in horror movies because the other is emphasized. Um, a synthesis is really like a masking of a return to the status quo. It's a fortified status quo. It's not like a real transformation. Okay. (laughs) And in the case of Lacan and especially psychoanalysis, or uh, I'm sorry, looking at like capitalism through Lacanian psychoanalysis, it would be a mistake to ever assume that you could go through a personal transformation and then arrive at a point of satisfaction because, and again, listen to the Eraserhead episode for this to be clear, but the main thing to remember about desire, the thing that drives the narrative in the Lacanian sense is that the the desired object, your object of desire is only valuable insofar as you do not have it. Because once you have it, once you do not lack it, it ceased to be a desirable object. And if you reach a point where your desired object is something that you have like consumed and subsumed into your identity, your subjectivity no longer exists in the Lacanian psychoanalytic sense. So it's kind of an impossibility for a lot of these movies to have that proper happy ending. It's a lie in the Lacanian sense, because you will always continue to be a desiring subject, which kind of comes back to this movie. I mean, literally the desires of the parents get them, fucking destroy them. Yeah. Yeah. And then Kevin is no closer really at the end. at all. Yeah. And I don't think this movie mounts a really like strong capitalist critique, but that one moment is so profound that it, and the fact of God being the one who could have prevented it. It's the nature of the Supreme being in this movie as somebody who allows all this to happen and yet still passes it off as some sort of sentimental free, free will bullshit thing that it comes off as some sort of statement about capitalism or specifically neoliberal capitalism because it's like, Oh, just believe in ideology or whatever. (laughs) Oh, here we meet our characters. Max, I'm curious, what do you think about their entry into his room versus the uh, similar scene in Labyrinth? Um, so this is goofy and fun. Um, we get a, we instantly know that despite being able to travel through time, these guys are bumbling idiots and have no idea what the fuck they're doing. (laughs) Yes. Um, and that they're inherently cowardly when they don't think they can win. It's a lot of good character building very quickly. Whereas in Labyrinth, you do get, it does give you slightly like a tonal thing. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, David Bowie can just sort of warp things and it's not going to be fair. And, but it, it does like sort of set like, fantasy and reality apart from each other. 
And also I get to look at David Bowie, which is always a plus. And his bulge. Yes. Yeah. That's if you ever want to play a drinking game with a spectator film podcast, just listen to how many times we end up bringing that up. But I think it's a weaker introduction overall, even though the Goblin King is he is wonderful to look at. And one of the highlights of that movie. I I think this movie has better character. Because this the only thing that compares to this in Labyrinth is the ending scene where all the characters she's made friends with at the end come into her room. Yeah. But we don't learn anything from that other than that she hasn't grown up at all and she needs to have imaginary friends to get by in the world. Yeah, sure. And also, like, the thing we can definitely, I think, say about this scene and their arrival and intrusion into the ordinary world is that their escape out of it is definitely superior to Labyrinth, where yes. I can't even remember how she ends up in the magic world. David in Labyrinth. just takes her there. Yeah, that's so lame. And this, it's like, it's this great, like, again, kind of Maurice Sendak, where the wild things are feeling, where it's like, oh, we're just going to push the, oh, we can push the wall back. And uh, that wall is covered in all the places they'll end up going, even though you don't realize that before. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of that in his room, too. If you go back and you look at the room, you're going to see a lot of the uh, sort of Alice in Wonderland narrative type thing or Wizard of Oz type thing, even more specifically, where another key part of that type of story is that the world of fantasy is populated with like sublimated elements of reality from the world of desire. So that's why in Wizard of Oz, it's similar casting or the same casting. It's the same actors playing all the different people and they're just people in her real life, too. Right. Yeah. And here it's like, oh, look, he's got the magic box theater and everything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, this movie kind of like plays with that, too, where it's like it ends up just being real, though. And I think the thing is that if you're looking at this movie, I think you have to also argue that it's like an exploration of fantasy as much as it is going into the past. I think it's more fantasy, honestly. Yeah. Because it's a fantasy past like yeah none of this is even attempting to be a little bit historically accurate no but in an interesting way perhaps you could make an argument that this movie um is sort of like deconstruct oh by the way that that person who's who's uh muzzling kevin in the hay in that scene his name is malcolm dixon and he died earlier this month rest in peace I know I'm sad. But of course... uh, Speaking of actors, what do you think of the child actor in this movie? He's kind of meh. What's the problem with child actors? They can either have like really stand out like, wow, how the fuck are you six years old? Or they can just be insufferable. Well, you know what? Terry Gilliam shares your opinion. One of my favorite quotes from the uh, commentary track on this disc is just Terry Gilliam at one point saying, actually, where is it? He says, uh, oh, I, got it right. I hate kids' films. I hate kids' actors. Yeah. Terry Gilliam. Uh, <laughs> and I think that instinct is partially responsible for a lot of the fun stuff about this movie where he hates the sentimentality of them too, uh, which is why you get that ending. Um, but I mean, that's a very British sentiment. I'm just like, oh, fuck. Fuck the kids. Fuck kids and sentimentality and enjoying and having a good relationship with your family you should just grow to hate everybody and hold that inside and let that destroy you and then what invade other countries to get it out no that's a fucking catholic thing it's an english thing no i think it's i think it's catholic especially the holding it inside you yeah yeah the english aren't known for their outward affection all i'm saying is that this movie seems to be taking joy in whatever you're saying it's like don't learn to hate not getting along with your family, enjoy that you don't. That's really the thing that this movie's saying. Um, Oh, what was I going to say? I forgot already. Oh, uh, but to talk about the kid actor and why this is a kid's movie, uh, we were talking about how this sort of precedes and anticipates movies like E.T., right? Yeah. And uh, the reason it's a kid's movie, as far as I can gather is that they wanted to make a family movie because this is one of the films they produced trying to get Brazil off the ground, which they were doing for years, Terry Gilliam specifically. And based on the comments that they said in the commentary track, I kind of like extrapolated like my impression of the criticisms of Brazil they got immediately before making this was that it's not 
a movie for the whole family that they can market. So th- maybe they were thinking, let's make a movie for the family. And if it's a success that we will have proven that we can do it. Even though we have no intention of making Brazil that way. <laughs> That's a cute little line. Oh, what? The, do you want to be leader of this gang? No, we agreed no leader. Right. So shut up and do what I say. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of good lines. Also, I just want to say, I think, uh, the movie slows to a crawl when they're not on screen. Honestly, yeah. they're the way they work off each other is absolutely wonderful. I would, I do want to say David Rappaport as Randall gives quite a good performance, um, as the leader where you really do feel like in his behaviors, there's this deep unspoken need or like need to prove something yeah. to himself. I really do think it's a pretty fantastic performance and it does, it does really represent itself in almost every interaction he has with the other people. And it's quite interesting because you don't often get to see many movies with little people, especially at this time, uh, being like main characters like this. And that relates again to like (laughs) the weird like story of how this wound up to be a kid's movie, uh, where, okay, Terry Gilliam talks about that image of the night bursting through the closet as like the starting point of his writing. But then another thing is that he really felt the strong desire to want to shoot it from the ground tilted up. Like he's in awe of it. I imagine with a very wide angle lens. And, uh, for that, he's like, well, we can motivate that camera angle by having a child be the main actor. But he's like, but I hate children. So I don't want to just have one child carry the whole movie. Uh, Yeah. But then he's like, but then do I want to add more children? He's like, no, that's terrible. So he's like, I guess we'll cast little people. Which, yeah. Is a very bizarre way. And and it's a question I brought up to you the other day. Yeah. It's like, what is this movie's view of little people? Because that can be a problem. You can go to the, what's that movie about the making of Wizard of Oz? Or the... Oh, like Beyond the Rainbow or whatever? Where they're like venomous (laughs) <laughs> like evil alien they're monsters. They're basically gremlins. Yeah. And it's like, oh, they're God. destroying this hotel. Even if they're not, obviously um, let's look at some of the reference points maybe for this movie. Uh, oh, here we have the punch and Juji show, by the way, just to interrupt us with Napoleon and Ian Holm. Yeah. Uh, who I think is solid as Napoleon. Yeah. Um, he's enjoying his, his little theater puppet show which again references back not only to the uh, magical theater box in Kevin's room, but to the way his parents were consuming the stupid frivolous TV show. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, But to answer your question, which I think is important to ask of this movie and something that I feel like a lot of critical accounts of this movie haven't tackled, at least from what I've seen and definitely letterboxd reviews. I haven't seen a lot of people bring up like how this uses its little people actors. Uh, It's a trope, right? The idea of like in Wizard of Oz. The mischievous little people. Yeah, like Munchkin Land or, uh, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, right? And the idea that she, you know, much like Snow White, he is entering, he's leaving sort of a secluded area and he's sort of in the woods now, right? And these people are going to take him under their wing. Yeah. Um, So I can see those similarities. But according to Gilliam on the commentary track, that was his rationalization in casting them, which is very bizarre, and I'm not sure how that fits into that equation. But I think ultimately it still plays into that image. Now, here's the thing, though. I also get the impression, especially from the commentary track, that casting them was like a weird punk, like, fuck you thing to, to you know, the evil studio executives, where he's basically like... Again, this is just my impression because he doesn't say this, but I get the impression Terry Gilliam is like, yeah, I'll cast these people that you only ever put in like R2-D2 outfits. Yeah. I mean, we have, um, oh my God, his name is not Kenny Rogers. Kenny Baker, R2-D2 himself is in this movie, right? Uh, So I feel like that was part of it. And honestly, I kind of enjoy that. I get that, but um, I like, and they're never... They're the assistants to God, basically. So I guess they're angels. Oh, kind of. Yeah. I guess if, I don't know. The thing is, it it also still comments on their height in bizarre ways. I don't know if it's condescending or not, though. The only thing I can really say for sure is that 
they did the thing of casting little people as like, you know, in the role that you would, that you sort of expect for a movie t- like this, you know? Yeah. It well, is still like a type. And furthermore, you call them angels, but there, you could also potentially look at them as like an, a Santa versus elves. Kind of, yeah. Situation too, which is also potentially problematic, but like, I don't know. I can't deny that I do enjoy any opportunity of seeing actors who usually are behind some sort of prop or makeup taking a leading role. I'm looking into Malcolm Dixon, the one who died earlier this month now, and I'm disappointed. He was also in Labyrinth. A lot of these people, you know, they were in all these movies together. Mm-hmm. A lot of them wound up being Ewoks yeah, as well. Yeah, he was in Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there he is right there. He was in Willow as well. Yeah. But again, I also feel like you get moments like this where they're performing for Napoleon now. But I think you could potentially look at that. I don't know how they wrote that moment. But I know that Terry Gilliam, his style of filmmaking, there is you know plenty of improvisation where sometimes they just find an idea and they run with it for a crazy amount of time until it becomes the whole scene. And maybe that's why this feels so much like a sketch. But there's a reason why they're doing this more vaudevillian stuff. Because a lot of these actors, it seems, have a more vaudevillian background because they're little people. So they do more different types of carnival-esque vaudevillian performances, right? So I if you're talking that. about the agency of the actors and stuff like that, I don't know. It's an, it's an interesting question to, when you're looking at this movie. And I know it's like, it's hard to get certain roles as a little person in acting. Like not everybody is going to look out as much as Peter Dinklage and find a character that's like specifically written to work dramatically and seriously and then get other roles because of that. So like I, I get you have to take what you can get, but I don't know. I, this movie does ride the line fairly well, I would say. Yeah. And, and frankly, there, it's very simple to be improved to the point where it would be like, more interesting in its treatment of them to me where maybe, you know, I don't know if I was doing this movie, maybe what I would have done is like seeing if there was like, okay, maybe they're not like, maybe they're not like ontologically different from humans. Like they're not like elves, but maybe it like for some reason, God requires little people (laughs) to help. Maybe there's some reason like little people are the only people who can like help keep the universe in order, so he has to go throughout time and recruit like the absolute best ones. He yeah. was, I don't know, that's a mythologizing of them again. But uh I'm just saying, like, but then it's sort of the point is that it's you're treating them as humans instead of like like elves. Creatures, yeah. Yeah. I get that. Um I don't know. Well, I mean they did say the reason later on in the movie, they say the reason that they got like demoted was because they they made like a 600 foot tall tree that just produced horrible smells. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's pretty good. Honestly, if I worked for God, that's what I'd do. Not even intentionally. I'd just be like, Oh, this thing is fucked up. <laughs> you wouldn't start with lasers automatically. Lasers eight o'clock day one. <laughs> David Warner has so many great lines. <laughs> we're, we're very far away from evil. Unfortunately, we'll get to him soon enough. The structure of this movie is very bizarre, though. It, had, it Structure is a very strong word for it, honestly. It is kind of like sketches. And then we run into the plot 30 minutes in. Yeah. Yeah. But I kind of don't mind because it's just too much fun. Every episode is too much fun. Um, what I will say about each of these episodes, though, episodes structured on Kevin's fantasy, like we've talked about. And if we look at fantasy as something that is a counterpoint to the status quo that we saw in the opening prologue segment when he's at home with his family. I think the idea of each of these fantasy episodes is that Kevin fantasizes about them because in his mind, they exist outside of the idea of capitalism, right? And the, the way in which this movie deconstructs each one of them is sort of this idea that every time they go to a different place, somehow something about these characters is revealed to be, still entwined with a type of ideology you would say resembles what Kevin would see at home. Well, that's the thing. Like 
these are uh, that's why I think it's entirely fantasy mm-hmm. is because all of them are they're not really and historically accurate seems to like be going too far but like they're all just caricatures of the traits that Kevin and will like admires is interested in like yeah as a little British boy looking into history the only thing you're gonna read about Napoleon from the British side is like oh he was just a short little guy who was obsessed with his height and wanted to conquer because of that yeah uh, um, but he was a conqueror and he was yeah. majestic and then it's like oh Agamemnon was just like oh he was a kind good man and was constantly scheming wife didn't like that and Diego I feel like Agamemnon is constantly the villain Everyone remembers him from the Iliad being the guy who's like, I want to fuck girls. Yeah. It is weird they chose him. They could have chosen anyone, I guess. Odysseus, like Leonidas, I don't know. (laughs) Oh my God, can you imagine him meeting Gerard Butler, a different Scottish man, instead of Sean Connery? And then Gerard Butler's wearing a Speedo, and he's like, where's your Speedo, son? (laughs) Here, take mine. That's disgraceful. (laughs) You should hate yourself for not slapping the man next to you his ass grab that ass you're a spartan not grabbing another spartan's ass is kind of gay this is the gayest shit i've ever <laughs> seen in my life i love that's we've tried to, we, we we attempted to do 300 one time and you suggested failed. it yeah and the reason we decided not to is because we came to the conclusion that it was just too embarrassing yes but the fact that like they have to sneak the line in like earlier on, just like oh those Athenians, those, those man lovers, boy lovers, yeah, and it's just like okay, the way he emphasizes the B when he yeah. says boy lovers is hilarious. Say it with me, Max. Those boy, boy lovers. lovers, yeah, and it's just like okay, we get it, no homo, but also <laughs> yes, have you all seen this? Of the homo. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I'm sure somebody will do the whole fight club thing to be like, yeah, that's the point. It's like a satire. Like this, blah, blah, blah. It's like, don't tell me that this movie doesn't buy in 100% to everything that's going on. No. On screen. That's fight club is a movie I would actually want to talk about. Cause there is an interesting back and forth in that. There's, sure. there's no back and forth to be ahead. I guess my point in that is like, I don't need this movie to be two and a half hours to just to tell me how stupid it is. Oh no. But also like, <laughs> Fight Club has the the movie has the American History X thing where it's like, yeah, you're telling me that white nationalism and Nazis are bad, but also you have all these scenes of just like, look how fucking cool these look gangs. how sexy Brad Pitt is. Yeah, look, look at, at him move like a snake. Oh, look Usually at this. girls do that. Uh, he's, Bet you've never seen a boy do that. He's and like <laughs> neo Nazis love the fucking imagery from American History X, and there's a reason why. Oh, those Pratt Falls. Yeah. Anyway. We did not comment on the production value at all. Uh, yeah, no, that the set there was great, and I was that was some random castle. I in was Wales. talking with Austin that like this could be like because this movie had a budget of $5, five million dollars, which again inflation, but still, what the fuck? Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> that that castle thing is huge. Like what? It, like what the fuck? Five million dollars. And I'm sure a lot of that was covered with good camera angles and whatnot, but still, like it was very well made. Yeah, so. they they found a way to to add props or whatever the fuck it was to give you the sense of the location using very little money. Yeah, you got to watch this movie for that, if nothing else. But Max, before we go too much farther, I do want to use up the first of my quotes in reference to that idea we were talking about Kevin's fantasies. And how these are his fantasies as being things outside of capitalism. And I want to relate it to the idea of people viewing Reaganite cinema as a fantasy, where you turn your brain off, and that's how you engage with it. This is from Andrew Britton in his essay, Blissing Out, The Politics of Reaganite Cinema. He writes, artifacts which tell us we are being entertained also tell us that they are promoting, quote unquote, escape. And this is the most significant thing about them. They tell us that we are, quote unquote, off duty, and that nothing is required of us but to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Entertainment, that is, defines itself in opposition to labor, or more generally, to the large category of the rest of life, as inhabitants of which we work for others, do not, in the vast majority of cases, enjoy our labor, and are subjects to tensions and pressures that the world of entertainment excludes. It is of the this as an essence that entertainment defines itself, thus while appearing, at the same time, as a world unto itself. It does not relate to the rest of life, but only by way of absolute otherness, and when the rest of life puts in an appearance it is governed by laws which we are explicitly asked to read as being different from the laws which operate 
elsewhere or different from the laws which operate elsewhere. Uh, the explicitness of these strategies, the fact that they are always mediated by some form of direct address is the crucial point. It is a condition of the function of entertainment that it should admit that the rest of life is profoundly unsatisfying. Entertainment tells us to forget our troubles and to get happy, but it also tells us that in order to do so, we must agree deliberately to switch life off. Okay. There's going to be more of that, so get ready. <laughs> but it's interesting when you look at this movie as something of like different layers of asking how we engage with something that is supposed to be frivolous and devoid of value because it's it's endorsing some sort of idea of neoliberal capitalism. The t parents are watching the TV show, Max, but Kevin is also kind of in his own way participating in the same thing by fantasizing about these historical figures. And that's why there seems to be an air of disappointment with each one we visit with the, exception, with the exception of Agamemnon. And the thing is, he's not disappointed with Agamemnon, but you know who is really disappointed with Agamemnon? Agamemnon himself. Yeah. Where he's like, you don't get it. This is miserable. And he's like, you can kill a bunch of people, right? And he's like, yes, yeah, sometimes it has to be done. Again, then, then he teaches him cup tricks rather than how to kill people. But I think that moment is important too. No, it's it's sweet. It's a Lacanian moment. If you're talking about Lacan and capitalism, because again, in Lacan, the desire is uh, the object of the desire is only the object of your desire insofar as it is missing. Because once you possess it, <laughs> I love this line. Oh yeah. It's a bit of a botch job. We only had seven days. Yeah. That's the great thing about this movie is how frequently it relates back to the idea of like work and labor <laughs> well it's just like it reminds me of like video game things where it's just like oh there was i don't know if you ever played silent hill 2 but it's considered one of the best horror games of all time okay and uh they did a remaster of it and the game's covered in fog but they're like oh it's hd now now we can show more of the town and it turns out most of the town doesn't exist and the fog was put there like as a temporary measure because they're like, oh, we don't have like the technology to render all of the town, but then it like worked really well. So when they remove more fog, the game just looks like shit. So <laughs> sometimes stuff that happens because of crunch and technological lim limitations ends up making the entire thing better. Yes, we see this in movies all the time. <laughs> oh, Shelley Duvall. Shelley, help! <laughs> help, I say! Now, these are our sort of people. I mean, frankly, Max, these are more our sorts of people, too. If we were in the Middle Ages, we would be these people. We would be the people gathering dirt in Holy Grail, talking about living on, like, an anarcho commune or whatever. Yeah, we would. And we'd be like, we have a podcast. <laughs> Every other day, we alternate picks of movies. <laughs> <laughs> You are king, and you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? I didn't vote for you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Come on, don't be so wet. Nah. Who says that? Me to my girlfriend every night. Um, what? Exactly. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Fucking... Can you imagine just getting cast as like ugly bandit number three? <laughs> Some people make all their money, their entire career off of that. <laughs> I remember there's this one, I can't remember his name, but there was this one actor in the 90s. Oh, this is one of my favorite performance moments where they're like challenging each other to see who's the worst criminal. Yeah. And he keeps asking Randall like, would you steal from an old lady who is blind? And Randall's like, you bet. And he's like, would you steal teeth from a beggar? He's like, absolutely. Toys from a child, every chance I get. And then they just growl at each other. But speaking of the weird structure, I feel like they should have met Robin Hood later. Yeah. <laughs> because it seems like Robin Hood is the guy who's like, the mo if you're fantasizing about something that's outside of capitalism, he seems like he's going to be more towards the extreme end of that fantasy because that's like his whole thing. You know, he's like, oh, man, he, he steals money from the rich people and gives it to the poor. What could be more adventurous than doing that as a bandit? Yeah. 
But it's like we meet him 20 minutes into the movie and then that's dissolved. Because I don't think of Agamemnon as being like... No, I guess it's... And you could have written the script differently. But like a traditional movie, you feel it would be just like he meets Robin Hood and he's just like, you guys, I want to stay here with Robin Hood because he's actually doing something good and you guys are just selfish and stealing everything for yourself. Robin Hood's actually doing something back and they both have like some sort of a common ground type of thing going on eventually. And that's how like that situation resolves. But no, we meet Robin Hood and he's like a weird politician almost. And frankly, what I think is an essential John Cleese performance. Yes. <laughs> Even just walking out, you start laughing. I'm Hood. I'm Hood. It's so fucking bizarre. On the commentary track, his explanation of this is so amazing. Yeah. Where he says the idea of how they would play it was describing like when some obscure member of the royal family would interrupt like the start of a football match. Yeah. And by that, I mean soccer, of course, and shake hands with the entire team right before like the most important moment of their life. And then John Cleese's response to that. And he gets angry as he's talking about it. He's like, why the fuck are you doing? Like, you're going to push pause for like 4 million people trying to watch this so you can shake their fucking hand when they don't even know who the fuck you are, you stupid old idiot. (laughs) And that's how he played it. And if you haven't seen this movie, you need to just watch it. Like, look up this performance because it's really quite amazing. He's basically playing him like some weird politician... (laughs) who's like on the campaign trail or whatever. And he shakes their hands. He's like, you're a robber too, aren't you? Jolly good. I used to rob back in the day. Yes. But they're interacting with him as if he's like the paternal figure they're in search for. Yeah. This entire time, right? They're like, you're the guy we look up to. You're the one we admire. And then it's just dissolved immediately because <laughs> the poor will will be so happy about this. Thank you so much. The poor. <laughs> oh, you must meet them. Uh, Something about it is so fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> Go get the poor. I love how this this brutish man's name is actually Marion. Is he Marion? What's the, going on here? He's the Merry Men. <laughs> and then, like, basically, Robin Hood just like passive aggressively like takes all of it. Yeah. Really. <laughs> well, what, what were they planning with doing it? With I think it? they were just like, "You're a bandit like us. You'll like." we'll join up and we'll steal more and it'll be like this great party. Also, but that's something that's never explained. What are they planning on doing with all the riches they steal? Nothing. They're just like, whatever. And then this inexplicably punching these people in the face as he distributes the gold. He's like giving away the gold to his constituents, basically, Yeah, is what this is like. Remember who gave it to you. Is that absolutely necessary? <laughs> it is necessary for this man to punch them. Oh, for- and it is this weird, and you know what else? Um, I think they mentioned it's, it's like your money or your life all over <laughs> again. Which kind is, of. Which is, I believe that's a Robin Hood thing or initially. Really? Your money or your life. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, these Monty Python people are smart. I'm sure there's all sorts of fun historical yeah. stuff in this. They always do that with historical references and everything. Um, often it's just very cheesy jokes. But it's still in there. Oh, John Cleese. (laughs) But I also mentioned like, um, or no, I remember one of them mentioning sort of on the, on the commentary track on the disc, maybe that it was, they made a comparison to it being like an unemployment line where I'm not sure exactly how they were referencing it in like 1980 or whatever. But the idea of like, okay, you get something, but you're still like fucked. By getting yeah. this, you know, like it's not really helping you quite as much. But the point is his way of performing that I think is key to this being dissolved to Robin Hood being dissolved as like this heroic figure. Which the only one that kind of retains his heroic status is Agamemnon, but he does so tragically. And then he shows up later. But as a fire, as part of the like neoliberal 
satire of like, look, he's back. Oh, here we go. Oh, here's David Warner. Is David Warner your favorite? Um, I mean, aesthetically, there's nothing close to him in the movie. Jesus Christ. They do admit to ripping off Alien. Yeah. I mean, no, he has an H-car Giger head Pete's obviously. And they put him in so much KY jelly that I think that it was a joke that they just left these like ponchos on the rest of them. <laughs> Because it's like they probably originally meant for it to be like dry. Some like weird demon type things on the top of them. But they're I, just like, eh, fuck it. I do remember they were like Terry Gilliam also says like. Says like, oh, it was something about covering everything in plastic. Like plastic things are evil. <laughs> David Warner blows up so many of his henchmen for saying contradictory things. His delivery is amazing. <laughs> I love how they do the same joke again. The moment he's like, I made myself. Don't ever talk to me about God crea- having created evil. Mm-hmm. And then the very next moment, the guy's like, but when you say that, do you mean like, how is that possible? Because why didn't you escape the fortress mm-hmm. of solitude? Or whatever the fuck he's in. <laughs> it's so great. I'm sorry, I should be commentating, but like it is just generally, that's a good question. <laughs> However, Max, this is an important moment in the subtext of this movie. And this is when I feel really feel like it's starting to become like a neoliberal capitalist movie in the sense that it's like commenting on it. Because think about how explicitly they bring up the, the sort of like ideological gaps that are present here. Like where it's like, wait, he made you. Why didn't, why did he do that? Yeah. Um, why are, why is evil necessary? Something about free will. We'll get to that later. Um, but essentially this movie, I think structures a world that is full of these gaps and inconsistencies, which ultimately can be maybe read as being synonymous with, uh, with the time holes themselves as they're jumping through time. The to- the map itself sort of shows you the inconsistencies. <laughs> It's a pair of nipples on men. It is weird what he's saying. We did also miss the great line of when he's like, what will give you the advantage? And he's like, silicon digital watches. I will win because I understand digital watches. Lasers day one. (laughs) Uh But yeah, I think this movie, you can definitely look at it as a, as a sort of thing where like Kevin's fantasy is his means of like jumping through the ideological gaps that his like, um, I don't know, neoliberal home is residing upon as like a foundation. And uh, when he does that in, in using fantasy to jump through those gaps, mask, Max, he's kind of like learning to become more radical because he stops accepting money in the same way. And furthermore, with each step, he ostensibly, he becomes more distanced from accepting his home life. Yeah. Right. Well, just as like the three, I guess they have four historical stops, but like they get progressively less concerned with robbing stuff. Yeah. Now the movie's called time bandits. And Kevin becomes more abstractly interested in an idea of community. Yes. Where at first he's just going along with it. Then he finds Agamemnon and he's like, this is sort of what I want, even if he realizes it's not really what he wants. And then it's taken from him. Yeah. But no, I definitely think that's the sort of Lacanian reading of this is that you have this world that is structured by the Supreme being who's like a fucking banker basically. And Kevin tries to escape it by using the map to find the holes in this, in this system that ideology cannot cover up or are only covered by ideology. And through his fantasizing sort of pierces through that, that cover that ideology offers. And then he, he is able to navigate through these different holes and explore the world he lives in to the, until he reaches a point where he's now alienated 
um, from the society in a way where he can no longer be like potentially truly recuperated from it. I think it's up for debate how pessimistic or optimistic this movie is with its ending. Its ending is so abrupt that it's a little hard to say, but I think it almost feels like one of those things where like they ran out of money and they're just like, Oh, I guess the movie ends here, but I don't think that's the case. Nope. I think it was just, Terry Gilliam being like, fuck you and your sentimentality. And I think he has a point in doing that, even if he doesn't realize it, because I think that sentimentality is the core of the ideology. The comparison I'm thinking of, Max, is the ending of the movie Elf. Do you remember? Yes. Where Santa has the giant, like, new sleigh engine or whatever, because people's belief isn't enough to power the magical flying sleigh anymore. Um, So... So what happens? He crashes in Central Park because his engine broke. And what do we have to do to help him escape, Max? Even though the material conditions say otherwise, we have to hold hands and believe we have to start singing. And that's how we succeed. That's always a lie. That's always embracing ideology. You could say the same thing about the ending of Grinch, right? Because it's like, okay, the system that we live in has not it's resulted in material conditions in front of us that are not good. Right. But instead of addressing the lack that's in front of us, we just focusing on the, the minotaur fight here, but listen to me, instead of focusing on the lack of the material conditions in front of us, we just cover it up with ideology and then it's magically okay again, which this movie refuses to do. Yes. I mean, his parents blow up. Maybe that's magically okay for him. Maybe that's what he wanted the entire time. Honestly, it's okay for me. That's definitely the most amusing thing that could have happened. So is this supposed to be an actual minotaur? Uh, I think so. Because his head is like rotting off and he doesn't have eyes. It's a low budget minotaur. Yeah. Also, I get the impression that... uh, Terry Gilliam is kind of obsessed with like cows heads. Like when he designed those other really creepy creatures later in like the fortress of darkness or whatever, he's like, I don't know what the fuck these things are supposed to be at all. (laughs) He's like, I don't understand what any of this means. He's like, I just thought of like cows, but they were like high in the air. (laughs) High cows. Yeah. It's like, all right, Terry. Now, are you a fan of Sean Connery? Not especially. I think he's fine. I think he's fine, but like, I've never seen a movie and just been like, Sean Connery was my favorite part of that movie. Um, I wonder if I've seen one either. Like, I've seen some J- earlier James Bond movies that are like kind of fun, but it's like that's another thing. I've never been a Bond guy I, as much as I've wanted to be. Like, I I love the idea of super spy with fun gadgets stopping terrible things from happening but the like, thing is bond has become so much the baseline of that yeah then in some ways it feels kind of boring but i don't know there's some like okay there have some bond been good movies. Bond movies they don't I've, excite me though yeah and i don't think he excites me in them even though i can see his performance in a more fun movie like i think he would be totally capable of hitting those notes you know what weirdly though is a performance of his that actually hits those notes for me is a performance in a weird, it's in a war drama that's like four hours long called The Longest Day. I think it's directed by Daryl F. Zanuck. If we ever did that, it really would be the longest day for us. It's a very long movie, but it's not like a great movie. It's just, he, they, it's one of those movies where they're like, we're getting all the stars across Hollywood. And then they market it that way. And it's got like John Wayne and he sits on his ass for most of it. Yeah. Um. But then they got Sean Connery for like, a cameo and he's just like running around Normandy with a pistol going like, Ooh, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, his scenes are kind of funny. Oh, I just, just picturing like, it's just one scene where they're like, they're showing the streets of Normandy and nobody else is there. And it's just Sean Connery darting in and out of frame with a pistol. Going, like, Ooh, like, ah, like crunk. We need to do Emperor's New Groove at some point. I'm sure we will. That movie's flawless. There's no problems with that movie. But no, if you want to watch a funny contrast, because again, I think people at the time viewed James Bond as being kind of silly. They were like, oh, so his performance in this 
Normandy invasion movie on the beaches of Normandy also must be silly. <laughs> it's like, this is a very weird tonal shift. Here we are in the UK. <laughs> yep. Agamemnon's castle. No, they shot this in Morocco. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I feel like I was Mor- going to say Spain when I was, we were watching it yesterday, but yeah, I, makes a lot of sense. I don't know if this is similar to like Greece at all, but it definitely has a strong Mediterranean yeah. feel to it, which, you know, Morocco sure makes sense. I feel like Morocco has been used as, um, Mediterranean settings by a number of different movies. I know that, uh, Orson Welles used it in his version of Othello at the very least. Oh, she has a burst blood vessel in her eye. Like Joe Biden. Yeah. She seems more present and aware of where she is than Joe Biden. Joe Biden is just charging up his laser (laughs) eye. (laughs) He's just waiting for the debate stage with Trump so he can kill him. Yeah. That's why he seems like he's going, like, losing it. All of his processing power is going to charging the laser eye. (laughs) Yes. He'll be able to talk normally right after he fires. It's okay. Yeah. Although, no, if that was true, the DNC would have already made a very dated, I'm charging my laser reference to early internet meme culture. and Oh, they would, it would be t-shirts and everything? Yeah. It'd be like the Terminator eye? Here comes Terminator Joe. I'm a charging up my laser. And then people would have been like, that was a meme like 20 years old. What the fuck? Are I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. It's that old of a meme that Austin doesn't even remember what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's like predates Rage Comics. I don't know what that is either. <sighs> You've seen Rage Comics. Um, okay. I wish I was in World War One. <laughs> That's like saying <laughs> in, the, in the Trojan Wars. But it is important to note, again, if we're viewing all these fantasies as something that Kevin views outside capitalism and then whether he realizes it or not in this moment do not exist outside th- those instincts, at least in those demands of labor in real life. Again, like entertainment movies. These are entertainment movies for Kevin, basically. Yes. What Agamemnon is saying that even though I am the one in charge and I am the king. Does and he have a tattoo in his arm? Yeah. Uh. I wonder if he has that in real life either. I was thinking, did they just not feel like covering that up? But uh, but no, I, I think I think Agam- the Agamemnon episode is interesting because he supposedly seems to fulfill that heroic stature. And yet you can tell from Sean Connery's performance again that it is not what Kevin thinks it is. So even if Kevin doesn't truly realize it, his desire is being subverted here as well. And he cannot truly escape. Did you not have a longer robe for Kevin Agamemnon? Starting to doubt your intentions. He must be one of those boy lovers. Yeah. (laughs) Leonidas just drops down from the heavens. (laughs) We Scottish men are supposed to be above this. We Scottish Greek men. I was giving Sean Connery a bit of shit before, but his performance is genuine in this movie. I think he does do yeah. a good job. Yeah. You feel the emotion. You feel that he's just like, I don't know what, where the fuck this kid came from, but like, I do want to care for him and show him that war is a terrible idea. Yeah. In the short time you see him, you do get a very, if you really pay attention, a strong sense of like quiet, quiet desperation yeah. on his part. Where he's like, wow, his life is fucking empty, isn't it? Yeah. And it's even more palpable when you think about like, okay, if Kevin hadn't been, hadn't fallen on him, he would have just been killed by his wife, who would go on to kill him, as we all know, yes. with Agamemnon. Um, and also the idea that, uh, you know, that this was just another one of her attempts to get him to sort of go after some sort of outside antagonist, which again is part of a neoliberal machine, right? What is, what is like a neoliberal culture sort of do? It's like Russian bots, Russian bots, some dude in the middle East, every descent is a Russian bot. Yeah. You project whatever you cannot avow in your own culture onto some outside enemy, an other even more useful if they're a monster with a cow head, Max. Yes. Because they don't look that, that ain't right. That looks weird. So 
we other them and then we attack them and we blame them for everything. Now that we've destroyed the the Manticore or whatever, uh, the Minotaur. Minotaur, thank you. Um, we get healthcare though, right? Because they took it from us. They took our job. The Minotaur took our jobs. Goddamn Minotaur's taking our jobs. <laughs> yes. Just because we're not born with the ability to know how to get out of labyrinths doesn't mean that we shouldn't have any professional labyrinth builders. I don't know. Doing my best to remember Greek mythology. That was Daedalus yeah. did the labyrinth with his son. I know, but the Minotaur was in the labyrinth. Yeah. <laughs> I would hate that. You want some fruit? Yeah, sure. I got to say. What about fruit that's been stored inside of a dead cow? And like, I will say it's very impressive how much they got out of $5 million, but those pineapples were fake as fuck. Yeah. And then half of the fruit isn't real. Half the ding. Fruit, the fruit has doves in it. Ding. That's not ding. That's just, this is a banquet that <laughs> I want to be eating. Do we have to catch the doves, father? <laughs> Do we exercise before we eat? Yes, Kevin, dance awkwardly in your seat. <laughs> Scenes like that where I'm just like, oh, this is just a kid. I forgot. And somebody's telling him just to clap awkwardly. But again, it is kind of, you don't know. It's, it's relating like, to the entertainment movie thing. No. There's so many moments of people observing shows in this. It, it's hard to direct kids to. Yeah, I understand why Terry Gilliam was like, fuck having 12 kids. Well, apparently, I won't talk about this for long, I promise. But uh, I remember hearing this one thing in the Star Wars prequels. George Lucas hated working with kids. Like, he was not, <laughs> he was just the worst at directing kids. He's the worst at directing anybody. But Faster, like, more intense. Yeah. Um, but the kid who played uh, Boba Fett as a child in the second movie. Yeah, what'd he do? He was just like, George was just like not giving him any direction and they just kept having to do takes over and over again. Cause like the kid had no idea what the fuck to do. Is there no assistant director? Who's like, don't worry, George, I'll take this. Is there no assistant director? Who's like ambitious enough to be like, George, don't worry about it. I'll handle it. So fucking Ian McGregor had to come in and just be like, okay, when you come in for this thing, like make a face, like you just smelled the, <sighs> the nastiest fart imaginable when you look at me. God damn it, George. And then the kid did it perfectly in one take and they got it done. And it's just like, just, uh, <laughs> I, I, I know that we're about to enter in the era of actually the star Wars prequels weren't that bad. Oh, it's, it's happened. Yeah. Happened from, I've seen like leftists that I like on yeah. Twitter and it's like your analysis is solid until you start opening your mouth about star Wars. <laughs> yeah. So please stop because by the way, you know what star Wars is? Reaganite cinema. Yeah. It sure is, Max. H-bomber guy, I know you're planning on doing that soon. You don't need to, buddy. You don't need In fact, it's time for yet another quote from Andrew Britton. Oh, boy. The feeling that reality is intolerable is rapturously invoked, but in such a way as to suggest that reality is immutable and that the desire to escape or transcend it is appropriate only to scheduled moments of consciously indulgent fantasy for which the existen existing organization of reality makes room. The ideology of entertainment is one of the many ways by which late capitalism renders the idea of transforming the real unavailable for serious consideration. Right? Serious, serious consideration. We consolidate all our of our creative fantasy not towards changing reality, but towards interacting with some other world that is already different. So damn wet. Some other world that is so damn wet. Penzi. Welcome back, Shelly Duval. It's so fucking wet here. You don't mind the thing on my nose? I feel like Shelly Duval is very good at at playing like credulous characters Aww. in like a in like a funny way. Also, I know the movie is terrible, but she was definitely born to play olive oil. Yeah. <laughs> that is definitely perfect casting. I'm Popeye the sailor. It'd be great if Popeye just like knocked out Michael Palin here. <laughs> he just came in. Although I don't know. I've never seen the Popeye, Robert Altman's Popeye. 
with uh, 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 Robin Williams. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if I would cast him. I've seen like clips of it. I guess he makes sense. I guess. Who would you cast as Popeye? Uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Is Popeye owned by Disney? Please say no. Probably. Or DC Comics. Popeye. I don't know who. I don't care, honestly. <laughs> you know what? Let's just stop this joke. <laughs> I think it's a Fox property. That's so Disney. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Quail's eyeballs. Interesting. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how they traded all their neat clothes for fucking tuxedos. I guess they traded in all the gold they sold from ancient Greece for specially fitted tuxedos. For one good on, martini. <laughs> on the Titanic, they just have... It's like a video game store, you know? You can just, like, get a bunch of gold and shit and just go to the local clothes shop and just, like, here you go. Take all of this, and I would like one suit, please. Oh, they also b- bought some new guns yeah. that we're not seeing right now. Then a new hat. Yep. And a new, like... Leveled up their stats a little bit, you know. They basically. bought a, like, uh, they expanded their base. <laughs> Enhanced their time map capabilities. Yes, so now they can go to the time of legends. I just started, because we're in quarantine, so when I'm home, like, there's not much I can go out and do, so I just started playing a very, very long RPG that I've been enjoying. What's it called? Uh, Persona 5. Came I out didn't a couple know what that of, is. Came out a couple of years ago, but... Basically, the whole plot is you're breaking into adults' minds and forcing them to stop being terrible people. And it's like it's like an Inception thing, but very anime and Japanese. Yeah. But in a good way. Not in a, oh, this is bizarre way. You know my feelings on anime. That he loves it and he watches it every day. Yep. And you know from how Max is saying that, that that's true. It is. Yeah. I agree with Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> Anime was a mistake. Now, Max, one thing I wanted to bring up in the conversation about how this movie treats little people, but we didn't get to earlier, is uh, how many of them are there? Six? Yes. But not really. There's seven of them. Because there's horse flesh, who is mentioned, but we never see. <laughs> because I guess we assume something terrible happened to him. He got eaten by, like... Someone by like Genghis Khan, maybe by a horse. No, he's horse flesh. He is now. Maybe he is a horse. I know in old cowboy movies, they always call horses horse flesh. They're like, that's some good horse flesh you got there. It's like, what? Or they call cows beef critters. Did you know this, Max? No. It's kind of disturbing and weird. That's like how English people call everything stupid stuff. Rare bit. Oh, fun fact about uh, English people being stupid. Uh, That was just the Titanic, which was certainly an example of English people being stupid. But also, that shot of the Titanic was footage stolen from A Night to Remember, which is also in the Criterion Collection, and I have it right over there. Um, Also, where do we stand on the, did James Cameron steal the... Absolutely. Yes. (laughs) Of course he did. I mean, that moment, too, if you're talking about Lacanian psychoanalysis, yeah. is a great example. The reason why people thirst over that romance so much is not because it's actually good. It's because in having lost it, Max, it can remain their object of desire. If they achieve it and it's their object of desire, now all they will know are the ways in which it is not perfect. But if they cannot achieve it, then they can fantasize about it like it's a black hole. It could be the repository for any sort of romantic fantasy they have. If only he'd survived, it would have been a perfect life. Lacanian desire requires that you never achieve the object of your desire. Romantic partners is a great example. By the way, that that person in the middle is a doll or a a puppet or whatever they put in the whirlpool. I guess it's because Kevin couldn't swim or whatever, but he looks like a corpse and yeah. it's horrifying for about two seconds. <laughs> I'll say there's just a dead guy there. Oh, here's a great one. Is he about to turn Benson? He's, he's going to transform Benson. That's, I think that's later on. Oh, I think that's just the first time we heard his name. Benson. 
Yes, we're entering the time of legends, and now Ooh. we're going, everything's inverted. I'm going to use my last Andrew Britton quote. quote. This is on Star Wars. He says, it leaves out everything that the existing reality principle that we would prefer to remember them, or I'm sorry, that we would prefer to forget. Redescribes other things which are scarcely forgettable in such a way that we can remember them without discomfort, even with uplift, and anticipates rejection of the result by defining itself as a joke. Thus, Reaganite Entertainment plays a game with our desire. It invites us to take pleasure in the worlds it creates and the values they embody, but because it is also ironic about them, it confirms our sense of what reality is and leaves us with, that, with the anxieties and dissatisfactions which leave space for Reaganite Entertainment. The films continually reproduce the terms of the world as it is, while also yearning for something different. If people go back to them th again and again, it is perhaps because of the lack of satisfaction the films build into the pleasure. They regenerate the need for escape, which they seem to satisfy and provide confidence of kind, which leaves us unconfident by celebrating and debunking the good old values and addressing them both as viable norms and conventions of the fantasy, Reaganite entertainment perpetuates a paralyzed anxiety and institutionalizes itself. Okay. So the point is that they do not refer back to life in any meaningful way, which again means that if we're going to use fantasy as something to try to return to real life with, if we view movies like The Land of Oz, right? And we view ourselves as going on the same narrative as these characters. And we're like in this Lacanian sense, we're in our world of desire watching the movie and we go into the fantasy. When we watch the movie, we're supposed to come back to the world of desire furnished with new abilities and insights from our fantasy escape. Oh, also, can I say that the most loving couple that we see, like the most genuinely loving couple we see in the entire movie is this ogre and his wife. Yes. That's another repetition you see is marital strife. Yeah repeated frequently throughout this movie. And even though this is the most loving couple, Max, in what way does this still sort of reek of this type of capitalist society? He's ailing from his labor. His body is like all wound down and terrible now because he's getting older and he's, his body has been abused by scaring people. This poor ogre, Peter Vaughn. Now it's problems all the body time. But this is just a great idea. <laughs> Do you want the foot powder, dear? Bloody prawns. Now, Max, the other interesting thing about this movie, and we're talking about it as something that's sort of subtextually about the idea of how people engage with entertainment right, is the framing device. It's very easy to miss, but this movie has a framing device because we zoom into the map. The, mo the perspective of the camera in this movie is the perspective of the supreme being watching this, th these events happen. And every time you put the movie on, what you're really watching is the supreme being going back to the start, starting point in time that this movie takes place at and then watching these characters do this. Yeah, I think this is genuinely sweet, honestly. It is sweet. But my point in bringing that up is like the idea that maybe even the supreme being in this movie is caught watching a fantasy instead of laboring. You know, everyone is caught into this fantasy and no one has any care about getting out of it. Uh, and that's why Kevin's parents explode. Yeah. The sounds they use for his cracking back are disturbing to me. It's kind of synesthetic. I don't know why. It doesn't sound at all like a cracking back, but it's just like, it hurts to me and I don't like it. <laughs> you imagine if your back made that noise, how much it would have hurt? You'd be dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't hurt at all. You'd be dead. You know what I think I don't like about this movie? What? Is that at this point in the narrative, Kevin starts to do something that he's never done in any other part of the movie, which is he seems to utilize some sort of information that he has from his status quo normal life to solve their problems, 
which is a typical thing for a movie like this to try to do. But usually what they do is like they set up the stretching class and then they set up like the sleeping potion yeah. thing. But it's like, what does fuck does Kevin know about stretching? Well, that's the thing. The beginning is very rushed. So like it makes sense early on where it's like, oh, we're in the middle ages. And he's like, oh, yeah, we are. It's like because we know he likes that kind of stuff. Yeah. We don't know that he likes stretching. Yeah. But you know what, Max, at the same time is like, would when that be more stupid? When it's overly set up, like you see every arc of the movie coming where it's going to be like, I saw my dad doing stretches for his back. And then we have the obvious fan- fantasy parallel to my dad, the ogre. And I help him with stretches and then yeah. he becomes nicer. And then I go back to the real world. And my actual dad's nicer to me. I think that's another way you could look at Kevin's yeah. fantasies is not just something that exists out of out of outside of capitalism, but he's always reimagining at least the people they visit a version of his dad that he kind of aspires to have. And in most of them, he's somehow disappointed. Yeah. Including this ogre, like you said, could be a version of his dad. And at the very least, we know his dad probably stretches because he seems to be wearing athleisure, (laughs) athleisure wear. I think, well, everybody in the eighties in England, I think just wore track suits. It was a law. Yeah. Margaret, Margaret Thatcher's insane fat fascistic control. That's that's why everybody was very happy when Athleisure she died. Athleisure for everybody. Oh, my God. I need to send you the clip of the BBC interviewing different people in the street on the day of Margaret Thatcher's funeral. They're like, <laughs> and they just interview this old Scottish lady, and they're just like, are you going to miss her at all? And she's like, no, absolutely not. I hope that somebody opens up her coffin and stabs a stake through her heart to make sure that she's dead. <laughs> like, isn't that an awful thing to say on the day of a funeral? No. <laughs> they should they should cut that together with interviews of like liberals in the US who would be like, she was a triumph for feminism. Yeah. Well, like it's like now how they're trying to Hillary Clinton's apparently going to be like writing a book and like how her running for president inspired people like AOC to run for Congress, even though AOC has said numerous times that it was Bernie Sanders that yeah motivated her to run. But also we need to start like, yeah, Jesus Christ. I'm just saying Hillary, you know what you could do? Ask Bill about why he was on Jeffrey Epstein's fucking airplane. <laughs> Although I'm sure you know the answer to that. Listen, pedophiles have money and you need money to win pe- yeah, presidential elections. What comes first, the pedophile or the money? <laughs> Real chicken in the egg situation here. Or is is Bill Clinton one of those boy lovers? <laughs> Probably. Got to go get his ass kicked by I uh, Russell Crowe or some other person. Liam Neeson. Is that who you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh so, my god! So you had a question the entire. T- you had a question yesterday. Was the giant always there? And he just had some sort of agreement with the ogres. Yeah. Okay. Which would be weird because the wind seemed to make the ship go. Yeah. Also, Max, really ingenious model work here. Yes. Uh, Lots of fun. If you listen to the commentary track, they give you all the answers. The strap around his head they used to inject. They created some sort of like, in a way that I think Starbucks baristas would admire, a like milk cream injection thing in his chin strap to make the white foam frothing at the water oh, right around his face. That's great. Yeah, so it really helped the scale. This and is, I think it works excellently. This is the most Monty Python-esque bit for me. Here. And what is it, Max? More marital strife. Yeah. Even in the time of legends, the completely fictional realm of this. Well, to be fair, all we've seen in the time of legends is marital strife so far. <laughs> yes. Marital strife and the man who's sadly alone. <laughs> I do feel weirdly bad for both these people in this hut who, you know, weren't doing anything. Um, but also this giant, because this giant ain't bothering anybody. He just walked out of the ocean. And then we we have the the weird solution of stabbing him in the brain. You know. Injecting sleeping potion into him. Smack him again. Now, Max, if you were in this situation, how would you get off? Drugs! <laughs> hey, I've got an idea. Would you use drugs? I'm sorry, I'm just going to screen cap that. <laughs> but how would you get off this boat if you were stuck on a boat inside a giant's 
face. I don't know if I would have the good sense to look for like a sleeping potion because no. I don't think I would assume there is one. I would have assumed to like try to cut into his brain and kill him. I think I would have like wrapped myself in the sails and tried to like improvise some sort of hot air balloon or like Leonardo da Vinci wing flying device. That's that's very nice. I would have tried to kill him. See, if you kill him, you can't control your descent. He could fall head first. If you jump off, you're probably not going to be able to make a functioning Leonardo DiCaprio or Leonardo DiCaprio. (laughs) No, I will make a Leonardo DiCaprio (laughs) flying device. (laughs) I'll fail to make. This isn't Leonardo da Vinci. This is Leonardo DiCaprio. (laughs) The cheap knockoff version. It's the version that Icarus got. I mean, I guess this works perfectly, but we didn't know how this would work. He could have just fallen over instantly and killed them all. I think Terry Gilliam really likes giants. He loves, he, I mean, he was the animator for Monty Python, right? So all those interludes yeah. in the Holy Grail with the hopping like sun and clouds and the giants and everything, that's all him. Well, it's fee fi fo fum. I spell the blood of an Englishman for a reason. It's just the English is natu- yeah, natural monster. The giant? Yeah. It's like how the, you know what Scotland's uh, national animal is? Loch Ness Monster, clearly. No. What? The unicorn. Okay. And the reason for that is because in mythology, the... <laughs> the unicorn is in Scotland? No, the unicorn can uh, is capable of killing the lion, which is the national animal of... Or has like historically been associated with England. Yeah. Oh wait. So yeah, that's why on like old English buildings in like in colonial cities in yeah. the U.S., you'll see town halls with a unicorn and a lion on them. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Like I'm thinking of um of like uh, the town hall in Boston. There's a big unicorn and lion. The like Scots and the English still fighting. Yeah. Kill that lion. So Max, I'm going to use a quote from a movie called or a book called Lacan and Contemporary Film. I'm sure you are. Written by Todd McGowan and Sheila Kunkel. Of course. This is from the introduction. Yep. And this is just a great way to introduce how this movie is definitely Lacanian. So listen to this. What was missing from this Lacanian film theory was any sense of the power of film to disrupt ideology and challenge or even expose the process of interpolation. They're referring to earlier in the introduction where they're talking about wrong-headed ideas of Lacanian film theory. This was the result of too narrow an understanding of Lacan, an understanding that elided the role of the real in Lacan's thought. According to this way of understanding Lacan, the signifier's authority was absolute, and its functioning was flawless. But this fails to see the signifier's dependence on failure, the role that failure plays in the effective functioning of the signifier. Failure is necessary because the signifier must open up a space through which the subject can enter. A perfectly functioning system allows for no new entrance, no new subjects, As a consequence, if the symbolic order is determinative in the path that it lays down for the subject, it doesn't lay down this path smoothly, but in a way that is fraught with peril. That is to say, the symbolic order continually comes up against a barrier that disrupts its smooth functioning, a barrier that Lacan calls the real. This barrier is not external to the symbolic order, the Lacanian real is not a thing in itself existing beyond the realm of the signifier. Instead, the real marks the point at which the symbolic order derails itself, the point where a gap occurs within that order. The symbolic order cannot exist without gaps at which its control breaks down. These gaps not only hinder the working of the symbolic order, they are essential to its working. Without the hindrance, the mechanism cannot function. In order to function properly, the symbolic order must function improperly and i think a barrier almost like the one they just broke yes to the real the time of legends the fortress of darkness (laughs) meanwhile in the (laughs) amazing miniature but the reason i bring all that up is you know you can dig into this movie with lacanian film theory but the idea is that when you have a system that ideologically as any system will, because in Lacanian psychoanalysis, you cannot exist without desire and lack. 
and you have a system that like sort of engenders that with ideology, that ideology is going to have holes in it because ideology itself is a type of glue that helps reconcile contradictions in your, in your system. And evil, as we've already seen in this movie, as something they've emphasized is a contradiction in this. Why did God create evil? And God later on, will talk about how evil has this utility that it apparently has served well. And The utility of evil here is to try to produce Kevin as a subject. Because if Kevin only has good, if Kevin only has his like status quo life, then he would reject it. Ideology cannot be a perfect closed loop because then it doesn't allow for a new entrance. I guess that's a way you could look at this movie, but I don't think the movie commits to that idea. Well, I don't think Terry Gilliam is interested in Lacanian psychoanalysis. No. But I think he chose a narrative structure that facilitates Lacanian reading very strongly. And he sort of, he buttresses that Lacanian reading by making it so much about capitalism and consumerism. Because one thing we talk about a lot is how capitalism engineers lack it it creates new things for you to lack to get you to keep buying things yes and part of like the way c- capitalism treats commodities is with this false promise of being like once you buy the commodity you will have less lack but that's not true max does buying a phone make you save money or do you wind up spending more money once you have a phone more money obviously. yes yeah obviously obviously Even if you did nothing with it, you would wind up spending more money if you had a phone because now you got to charge the phone. But also you need AirPods. Always with those AirPods. Oh, and we have the parents coming back. Yep. I like to think that even before we started time traveling, the show, Your Money, Your Life, was just invented by evil. (laughs) It's quite possible. With Jim Broadbent and his bangly pink outfits. And of course, why do they come here, Max? What's the thing that lures them? The most desired object of all time. Yes. But it's the transparent kitchen set that we saw before yes. on TV. It's evil. It's and it's a it's a trap from capitalism. And if you look at if you compare the fact that we saw it on TV earlier and you treat that again as the same type of airheaded entertainment that they're consuming, if you look at these characters, our time bandits. Yeah, their idea of themselves as bandits is kind of like the entertainment that they're consuming. So they're in love with this idea. They're in love with the idea of stealing the most valuable object in the world. But to what end? To no end. It's just, yeah. it's the object of desire that for them, if they possess it, we have everything, right? We're good to go. But that's never the case. Because again, with Lacan you are always a desiring subject. If you had your object and you weren't desiring, it would oh. destroy you. Yeah, here's a cow again. Rats. This this sequence apparently is one of those examples of Terry Gilliam basically being like the set piece was so much fun that I had to like I had to keep it in the movie and we it was originally going to be like 5 minutes long, but they're like we just kept elaborating on it. And I know it makes you dizzy, but I love this idea. Yeah, I'm I'm not a heights guy. (laughs) Never have been. Oh my God. Tom is breaking in. Hold on. Hold on. I should go fix the door. Hold on. Okay, guys. You'll be alone with me for a second. Talk about your fear of heights. Yeah, no, I've had a fear of heights ever since I was an incredibly small child, paralyzing to the point where even before my anxiety, like really started manifesting itself. That was the first panic attack I ever had. It was looking down from uh, the high building. I, I remember when my parents took me to Disney World when I was a small kid and they wanted to take the entire family on the Tower of Terror and I'm just like, mm, I, I don't want to. That sounds like a terrible idea. And they're like, no, no, you have to come with us. And yeah, no, I was shaking and barely breathing by the time I got off that ride. So that was fun. Good old times. So I can only imagine what it would be like for me in this scenario. I'm like, nah, I'll stay in the fortress of ultimate evil darkness, guys. Do you think they could have convinced you better if they, much like Leonidas, con- like accused you of being gay, bro, <laughs> for not doing it? Don't be gay. <laughs> I'm trying to think 
<laughs> how many years it will be before I came out to them. So I'm not sure. Oh my God. Now I'm thinking of that like tweet of the woman who's like, I don't want to go on dessert yeah. with a man because if they get, if they get dessert while we're on a date, they must be one of those boy lovers. <laughs> Oh my Ooh. god. Oh. I do love this. And I just love the fact that they're creating drama out of them just in like a set with a cage and then just a wide angle lens to show how deep it is. I love it. There's nothing required, Max. It's just it's just filmmaking craft. It's perfect. And then you could just get the actors to communicate it and some lighting. It's perfect. It's perfect. Now we have so many rats to eat. We're in such a better, better place now, guys. We have all the rats you could ever want. Do you want lunch? <laughs> oh, God. I do think there's something kind of intimidating and like, there's a wonderful like contradiction in this, the idea of like using the you rope. You just that's holding... Battlefield Earth, I just want to point out. I know, it's the only good part of Battlefield Earth. <laughs> um... That and the bartender bit. <laughs> Your friendly bartender. Yeah. That moment makes no sense on so many different levels. <laughs> no, it's just because John Travolta's been playing fourth dimensional chess the entire time. We just can't keep up with him. But it's only possible for him to play fourth dimensional chess because his like friend is so fucking stupid. Yeah. He gave it to a bartender. That's like something you can't even understand how funny it is in the moment. And the moment you're just laughing at it because you're like, what the fuck did he just say? <laughs> but then when you understand it later, it's like funny for real because it's like, you just gave that it makes your, no sense. You got drunk because you thought you were smart. So you decided to give the recording to, <laughs> to your bartender. Yeah. What are you? Th Here's the question. Is that, uh, is that a John Travolta thing or, oh, it, look, it's Malcolm Dixon. Woo I'd be really nervous about my glasses falling off. Yeah into the void guys I would, maybe you should have sent the guy without glasses on the <laughs> also it's really interesting listening to terry gilliam talk about them doing this where part of what they did he said um to make it look weightier was they slightly undercranked it to make it a little bit slower to add just a little bit more heft to them moving the rope up and down Oh, so close. So close. This is one of the many moments of the movie that seems to me like it's totally compatible with like a set piece from like Pirates of the Caribbean, the ride. Yeah. In fact, wait a second. Didn't the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie do this? I No, it did. There's a moment they're in like cages made out of bones because they're on a cannibal island. And it's like fucking cannibal Holocaust for two seconds. Oh, yeah. But actually, weirdly, Max, that that scene, this is going to be so, this is so obscure. But that scene is actually a reference to a Buster Keaton short film where he's on a cannibal island and he becomes like their god. That makes sense. Um, and there's a there's a bit where he falls off a fucking cliff. And he uses like a leaf as like a parachute and it doesn't work too I well. Have a, I have a very clear memory of the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie, but after that, they all sort of blend together. Yeah. But I will say, you know, I think, I think people, there's a little bit more of an argument in defense of the second and third one. And I kind of agree. I think they still have like neat set pieces in the second and third one. And of course, Bill Nye making his weird sputtering mouth yeah. noises. And there is, I, I like some of the world building that they do in the second and third one, like the pirate council and stuff like that. I think yeah. it's fun. Yeah. It's not like obnoxious yet. Or it's not entirely obnoxious yet. I did. I liked it when I was, however, what the fuck old I was when I saw it. Did you like Keith Richards? No. Is Teague Sparrow? I, I didn't see that one. That was the third one. Oh, no, that had to be the fourth one. No, that was the third one. No. Yes. The fourth one was uh, them looking for the Fountain of Youth or whatever. That was the fifth one. No, that was the fourth one. The fifth one was like Mr. Uh, uh, Javier Bardem. And he's like, I am a squid. <laughs> what? That's like his 
motivation or whatever. He's like a squid or something. And uh, Jack Sparrow is like, and he's like, you made me a squid. Ha, I was right. No, you were. No, you're not. Yes. Keith Richards in Pirates of the Caribbean four on Stranger Tides and three. No. Look up the third one. Max, you're going to have to do it. I'm doing it right now, and I'm going to be right. But I can feel evil coursing through my veins. I can feel how wrong you are coursing through my veins. Ding. (laughs) Ding. (laughs) Benson is just begging to be killed by his master. Again, like neoliberal in the sense that he's just doing the same exact thing, except it's I'm like... I'm going to do the opposite. It's like, what difference does it make if you just tra- change mountains into sea and then the sea into mountains? You just changed it. Makes no difference. No, no, you were right. I know. He's just showed up again in the fourth one. Probably because he wanted that sweet Pirates of the Caribbean money. Or just because he's like, I'll be a pirate. <laughs> He'll well, be a pirate. Well, well apparently, that's who... Johnny Depp based the character off of in the Keith first Richards. One. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? He, actually, he seems more like a glam rock guy, Jack Sparrow, yeah. but he definitely seems drugged out. Oh, here's a great, great line. Benson, I shall have to turn you into a dog for a while. Thank you, master. <laughs> That'd be my reaction. It's like, I have to be a dog for a bit. Cool. Stay Benson. God, the map. You should have made him a chihuahua. They're the only dogs that are vicious and angry about guarding things. <laughs> Even though I think chihuahuas get too much shit. No, they do. Yeah. I've met genuinely wonderful chihuahuas. Yeah, too. stop shitting on chihuahuas. <laughs> there are some that are just bad, but they're also very lovable cute ones as That's well. That's like with every dog breed. Yeah. It's the same thing with pit bulls. Not all pit bulls are bad, obviously. No, In fact, no. most are amazing. Most Every pit bull I've ever met has been the sweetest fucking thing and just wanted to cuddles and affection. Now he's talking science things. Because he understands digital watches. And computers, and I will be better than God after that. I love... It's always hard to get like a good performance out of a dog, but I love how they get the dog to try to defend the map in a way that seems still incompetent. Yeah. Like the dog is trying to bark at them, but he's like, burr, burr, burr. He, he, he's like, he's like do- moving in the same way the henchmen do. Yeah. The dog is like, he's trying to guard it, but he's Aww. just not good at it. <laughs> Did they just shoot? That's the real question. Which came first the scenes with the henchmen or the scenes with the dogs? Did they just shoot the scenes? I was the, wondering that. Did they shoot the scene with the dog and then just have the henchmen act like that afterwards? There's weird animal rankling moments in this because then we get the same weird shit with the pig, which we'll see in like 10 minutes. By the way, speaking of Pirates of the Caribbean, what else just happened? They threw that bone to yeah. distract the dog. All these connections, Max, what does it mean? What does it amount to? You know what I've decided, Max? What? I love most movies that have like a, a set with like a skeleton <laughs> chain to the wall. I love how he just casually lifts up his fingers and they turn into weird guns for a bit. Oh, he's pig. a pig. I really like animal heads on things in this movie. And then the, the, this creepy shit. Yeah. Oh, fuck. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I, who's going first? Uh, <laughs> these like hook cow things. They I remind know. me of the baby monsters in brazil in jonathan price's dreams speaking of jonathan price terry gilliam originally wanted jonathan price to play evil in this which i can't see i really do enjoy david warner in this (laughs) it's the pig now max what do you think about the legos here that is a weird touch. Again, it's one of those sublimation things. Is it? Is it just the fact that this has all been a fantasy? And like- but we know it hasn't. But you know what it reminds me of? Regardless of what their intent is, it reminds me of a chapter in uh, Roland Barthes' book, Mythologies. 
where he writes about how toys are weirdly kind of like miniaturized versions of labor that you perform as an adult. So he's like, we have miniaturized hospitals, miniaturized uh, cooking, kitchen things. We have miniaturized um, army soldiers, right? Yeah. It's all miniaturized versions for kids of things you do as an adult. So in his eyes, he views it as like slightly insidious and not good because he's like, basically what we're doing is we're teaching kids to accept certain things as taken for granted. And like, well, yeah, it's the reason that uh, you should never show your kids Paw Patrol because it teaches them that cops are on the same par as lovable dogs, which is an unforgivable crime. What? It's never mind. Just keep going. Paw Patrol? Paw Patrol. It's a show about oh. dogs being cops. Well, that's propaganda too. Yes. How do you think? Cop dogs are trained. You think it's normal? For, we were just them, talking about how they show them Paw Patrol. That's how they train canine units. <laughs> yeah, you know how we talked about like how like pit bulls have a negative, yeah, like reputation that I think they've partially shed in the internet era. But like, why is that the case, Max? Because is it possible they're bred to be violent? Yeah. Who else do you think possibly, possibly teaches dogs to be violent? <laughs> yeah. No, I've usually in most cases yeah. we think about that as abuse to the dog. Yes. Here David Warner just explodes mm-hmm. every last one of his his henchmen. I love how much his henchmen are excited to explode. (laughs) I mean, it looks like a lot of fun. I think Terry Gilliam really loved exploding things in this. Who can blame him? The parents explode. The henchmen explode. (laughs) Benson wasn't even doing anything. Yeah. Again, that was another one of those moments where Terry Gilliam was like, and fuck you, sentimental assholes waiting for the family film. I'll even blow up the dog. Yeah. And I'll just find a way to motivate it by saying he's a henchman the whole time. Full pig. Not a lot of times you see movies go full pig. Yeah. Especially family movies. It's a bold move. Mm. (laughs) Ooh, he's giving that creepy Jack Nicholson from The Shining stare. But wait a second. Our heroes are here to save the day. No. In a giant tank. And Max, the tank is a great example of one of those details that bother people who make the movie, but I never noticed until they mentioned it. Uh, Terry Gilliam is infuriated by the fact that the barrel shakes. (laughs) He's like, what the fuck is wrong with this tank? And apparently the tank did not work at all to the point where a lot of the movements for it, they just had people pushing it. (laughs) Well, I assumed that. I didn't assume they actually. Well, I think they bought a working tank. And then they're like, we've been swindled. Oh, I, I would have just assumed it would have been easier to like build a prop tank. Nope. They got a real tank. That seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> but here's the, here's the part of this that I love that I learned from the commentary track is that because of all the technical problems with the tank, they had to adjust their like shot order yeah. and their schedule. So of course, all these extras, they don't really know the finished film. They just have like the script that they're there for. Yeah. So everyone that's there on the day, he's shooting like these different scenes back to back. And everyone's like, what the fuck movie is this? He's like, and now we do the spaceship and then the Cowboys <laughs> come and then the Greek archers show up and that's when the tank arrives. And they're like, what the fuck is going oh, on? Are we going to talk about the lynching? Oh, just the fact that they say like, let's lynch him. Yeah. We're going to have a lynching. Uh, that's not great. Was there a perception that lynching happened? I mean, I know it happened to more than just black people, but... but I mean, the term in general, especially by the 1980s. It's an act of violence that is, in the 20th century, even more so than yeah. the 19th century, become more of a thing against black people. I'd actually even be curious to see at the like the lyn- anti-lynching laws, to see when any if there are any I don't, were passed no we don't have a federal lynching law i don't think not federal i mean like more state oh, yeah. level although we fucking i mean 
I hate how we don't pass laws because we're like, well, of course we, people shouldn't do that. Well, no, I, I saw a story the other day where it's just like, I was hanging out with my little sister and I saw this story. I'm just like, well, I guess that's good. But it's like one of those things that I assumed had already happened where it's like, oh, the Navy now bans a uh, use of Confederate flags. I'm like, good for you. Where, why the fuck has the Confederate flag been allowed? Yeah. Like what the fuck is that? They're traitors. Yeah. I thought you nationalists were supposed to hate them. Max, can I make another comparison here? I think this moment is potentially, you can see, as a type of, like, Kevin's attempt to destroy the real or return to the real with furnished with the elements of his fantasy, yeah. right? And it does remind me of the way we interact with the frivolous TV show. Why is it like a carnival device? It's like a TV show contraption, right? Which one will succeed in destroying the evil, your money or your life, right? And yet every attempt with these fantastical characters, whether it's people from the wild, wild west, archers or knights or a tank or a spaceship to destroy evil, they completely fail. And then the only reason they succeed is this is where the movie starts to become satire. Deus ex machina. Literally. Yeah. God just comes down from the sky and is like, fuck this. <laughs> I actually think the knights dying is the most disturbing. Yeah. Because we get we, this. We get a visceral, like, holy shit. There's yeah, blood. they're they're all just like they've lanced each other. That looks like, like a set piece of a Dark Souls game. Right? Yeah, it looks disturbing. And then uh, also just the fact that he puts on like a gas mask and it's like, yeah, it's like chemical warfare somehow. <laughs> I love how many reaction shots we get of the pig. <laughs> like Terry is very concerned with getting the pig's perspective on all of this. And definitely, if you're not on board with the movie at this point, you're just like, fuck all of this, I'm sure. How can you not be, though? A lot of people are not as big fans of this, because I I'm think... I'm not, like, a huge fan. I wouldn't say this is, like, one of my favorite movies now, but, like, this is just good fun. Yeah, and I wouldn't say it either. Yeah. And I would definitely acknowledge that this movie is kind of messy. Oh, structurally, it's very, very messy, but... But it's, like, whatever, like, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful buffet, <laughs> of great set pieces and performances from actors that I like. And then with the bizarre ending, how can I say no to that? <laughs> I'm imagining if somehow like the ending of Bill and Ted also went this way. <laughs> they just had to fight death this way. They're <laughs> Yeah, kind of. That's kind of what it is. Or like from the first one, their high school presentation goes very wrong. <laughs> so like for our presentation, we got like evil. <laughs> Just starts destroying everything. Oh, no. No, that one. Who I don't think has been named up until this point. It's Fidget. No, we just gave him the name. Fidget. No, they've used the name Fidget a lot. But of course, we know him because he's Kenny Baker. Yes. But it's okay, because God's about to show up. It really is. It really is the moment that makes this movie full, like, you can't escape the neoliberalism. Because it's like... You, it refuses to buy into the idea that these characters and their individuality have the power to overcome this structural thing that's happened to produce this evil or that their adventure will allow them to actually successfully, you know, gather together some sort of element of themselves that can, that can overcome even the slightest problem about their lives at home, at least for Kevin. But you know what? Also for the time bandits, does anything about their adventure here help them in their situation with God? No. 
Yeah. Basically, I know we haven't talked about it too much, but the premise of them escaping is that they're like IT workers who keep the universe running. Yeah. And they're like, we're tired of the, the corporate abuse. This is like, yeah, they're IT workers that like basically got demoted for like creating a 60 foot tree or whatever programming a funny thing into the code that like that that's like the equivalent of like just like putting a dumb signature at the end of like somebody's email or something in the it world i don't know it'd be something silly changing the the wallpapers on something to something dumb and then getting demoted for that and then he docks their pay again yeah actually this adventure didn't help them at all and then, of course, Ralph Richardson here as the supreme being. He's just a fucking banker. He's the head of a bank. Yeah. They envisioned him, I believe, they said in the commentary track, as a headmaster of a school. Really? And it looks like it, though, he right? He comes off as a banker to me. Like, they look the same, though. Yeah. With a gold pocket watch and everything. And then this is like a, his uh, like signature book all ready to go, right? The way he his dialogue, he's like, we've it, he talks about, it sounds like he's trying to balance a budget in everything he's doing. We'll sort him out first, right? Yeah. Oh, fidget. But Max, would you really want to revive him if you knew that all he had to look forward to was more work. Well, they get to create the universe just cause like you can't make one 600 foot tall tree that stinks. Max, you are conceding <laughs> to the neoliberal labor. True. What was it, Max? In that situation, it was your money or your life. Yeah, true. And God said, I'm choosing for you. It's your money. <laughs> By the way, I'm docking your pay. <laughs> And of course, here we have the ingredient here that we were talking about with the journey of the Lacanian real, right? Where, oh, the system can't be perfect because then it offers no opportunity for no new subjects. If you have a perfect system, we're it's not a closed like, system. The Knights thing isn't even like a small set piece. They're just like showing that they were holding in its center frame. <laughs> yes, they just stabbed everyone in each direction. It turned out quite well. I will say, though, he seems like a very irritating person to work for. Yeah. You know who else he reminds me of, speaking of bankers? Oh, my God, what the fuck is his name? I can't believe I'm forgetting this. From Citizen Kane. Oh. I know who you're talking about. The guy at the beginning. Yeah, who takes uh, little Charlie away from his mom. Yes. Mr. Fucking, uh, Mr. Fucking. Thatcher. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's WP Thatcher. Yeah. He's like Mr. Banks from fucking Mary Poppins. It's just that like level of like morally gray. You might as well say, why do we have to have evil? Yeah. Max, it's the crux of the whole movie. The entire ideology. Why do we uh. have to have evil? He walks behind a pillar looking for an answer. I think it's something to do with free will. Yes. Of course, there's the piece of evil that's going to wind up in the microwave and start the fire. Right? So, Max, God allows evil to destroy Kevin's yeah. parents. And it has something to do with free will. The antagonisms to the system are only there to provide some sort of entry point for new subjects. And I think this movie ultimately maybe is pessimistic in the sense that it thinks things like entertainments are limited fantasies. Where, what did he just say here? He's like, oh, you stole the map from me? No, you didn't. I let you have it. Yeah. So you could defeat evil for me. And I could see how it goes. But I'm still going to dock your pay. Yes. And put you back at the beginning of time. So for the for our time bandit characters, right? And Kevin. 
they go through their fantasies, but even when they're doing it in their descent by traveling through fantasy, they somehow work for the Supreme being. Yeah. And that is why I think this movie is ultimately pessimistic because it's like your form of descent is an illusion. Your form of individuality is an illusion because no matter what you're going to do, you're going to wind up coming right back here to suburbia essentially, or you're going to end up doing something that helps the placement of suburbia as a central part of this new society. And you cannot escape this through fantasy because no matter what fantasy you construct, it will somehow be corrupted or deconstructed when you finally interact with it. So instead of this movie making peace with the like Lacanian idea of being a being who is, you know, constituated by unending desire, this movie looks at the unending desire as something that is like handed down from a capitalist system. And it says, that's awful. (laughs) Right? Yeah. uh, So the fire has melted his fantasies away, the real real, uh, sources of his fantasy. And his parents don't really care at all. His parents just care about their... Their appliances. Their fantasy, yeah. Going in for the toaster. And it's Sean Connery. Agamemnon. In a certain sense, this feels... It's very weird, like we were saying, that this movie precedes a lot of the Amblin Stranger Things movies because it feels like that would be very much something you'd see. Um, Although you could also argue it refers back to Wizard of Oz, right? Yeah. Right? But it's like, then the movie really starts to like defy that logical understanding of the story by having Sean Connery just be Agamemnon still. When he has the pictures, it's proven it's totally real, right? Yeah. So it's not in his mind. It was a fantasy for him, or fantasy for the audience, but it was also real. Oh, no. And here we have the moment of truth. They touch the rock the moment he says not to touch it, and they fucking explode. (laughs) And then the firefighter just winks at him, just like, your parents exploded, bye. Yeah, and the fact that the firefighters just leave right then makes it feel like particularly like satire because it's like that totally defies any sort of logic. Yeah. His parents just exploded. Um, His house is on fire. He has nowhere to go. The end. Yep. And this movie is like, no, this is not a happy ending. Fuck you. And even if... He has to keep on fighting. Yeah, even if Terry Gilliam is not like interested in the subtext that we've been talking about, this movie... <laughs> you can still see the piles of dust where they are now yeah this movie out of sheer disdain for like the sentimentality of kids movies alone out of sheer disdain manages to sort of subvert that neoliberal ending because it's like fuck you belief is not enough and you thinking belief is enough is just stupid and of course we zoom out and we see what has it been the whole time? It's been an entertainment for us. It's been an entertainment for God. And we walk away having gained nothing except this sour taste in our mouth at the end. But that sour taste is what makes the movie. It's good sour. It's like some starbursts. Yeah. It's, I don't know. And I have a final quote to read as we're wrapping up. This is about, um, actually two quotes. One is just a sentence, but this is from Robin Wood in his great book, uh, Hollywood cinema from Vietnam, the Reagan. And this is his chapter papering the cracks, fantasy and ideology in the Reagan era. Uh, This is his first quote. He's writing about E.T. He says, not so much child's fantasy as an adult's fantasy about childhood. And then uh, in the same chapter, he writes, it is important that I am not posing diabolical Hollywood capitalist Reaganite conspiracy to impose mindlessness and mystification on a potentially revolutionary populace, nor does there seem much point in blaming the filmmakers for what they are doing. The critics are another matter. The success of the films is only comprehensible when one assumes a widespread desire for regression to infantilism, a populace who wants to be constructed as mock children. Crucial here, no doubt, is the urge to evade responsibility, responsibility for actions, decisions, thought, and and responsibility for changing things. Children don't have to be responsible. There are older people to look after them. 
don't worry, Uncle George, as in George Lucas, or Uncle Steven, as in Steven Spielberg, yeah. will take you by the hand and lead you through Wonderland. Some dangers will appear along the way, but never fear, he'll also see you fa- safely home. Home being essentially those good old values that Sylvester Stallone told us Rocky was designed to reinstate. Racism, sexism, democratic, in quotes, capitalism, the capitalist myth of freedom of choice and equality of opportunity. The individual hero whose achievements somehow make everything all right, even for the millions who never make it to individual heroism. And then in parentheses, but every man can be a hero, even such as the grudging generosity of contemporary liberalism, every woman. Okay. And I think that's a good summation of the type of send up this movie has right at its ending and the way sentimentality is sort of coincided with um, the embracing of that ideology. But yeah. This has been Time Bandits. It has. I just wanted to point out that also uh, we didn't mention it all during the commentary, but George Harrison did a lot of the music for this mu- yeah, movie, some of the songs and the song right here at the end. Well, which, uh, did he do a lot of the music? Yeah. I think he, at the very least, he just did the song. No, I, look, he did some of the music. Okay. He worked on it, but he wasn't the sole person, but he did work on a lot the of it. The people who produced this movie were the same people who worked at the studio that produced a lot of his albums, that makes sense. I guess. So, yeah. Originally, it was going to be peppered throughout with, with all his music throughout, which I think would have been a bad idea. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. they didn't do that. George Harrison a, was a very talented musician. I can't imagine it would be bad. But, but yeah. This so is a Spectator next. Film Podcast. Oh, you didn't want to say what you thought of the movie? You no. didn't want to wrap up? You no. wanted to leave things unresolved, much as if your parents had just exploded. Exactly. All right. So this perfect. has been the Spectator Film Podcast. Uh, if you would like to hear more of our show you can find us on uh, apple podcasts you can find us on spotify you can find us on stitcher or on spectatorfilmpodcast.com that is spectatorfilmpodcast.com we also have that letterbox yes it's at you can boy it lovers <laughs> that's not true you should change that to our, a spiritual thing <laughs> um <laughs> you might want to stop saying that or we're gonna start getting boy flagged lovers.